Father, we are grateful for your goodness, for your mercy, for your consistency. You are faithful, God, in all your ways. And we thank you, Father God, for the blessing of your word. For your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We thank you, Father God, that your word will not return unto you void, but it will accomplish that for which it has been sent. As we gather around your word, we pray, Lord, that your word will do us good. I ask, O oh God, for the anointing to bring forth your word with boldness and accuracy. I pray, Lord, that the word of God will actually come alive to us today in the mighty name of Jesus. I ask that you help us to be able to apply this word that we learn. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Good afternoon, everybody. Is it well with you? I see grandchildren in the house. Hallelujah. <laughs> we shall see grandchildren and great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren. And we shall all be in the Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Hallelujah. So today we'll continue with the message, Expressions of Love Through Worship. Expressions of Love Through Worship. Um, I did the first part some weeks ago. And we just we talked about worship being, uh, let me just go through some points. We said the first time the word worship occurs in the King James Version of the Bible is in Genesis 22 verse 5, where Abraham took his son and he said to the, he was going to sacrifice the son and he said to the men, I and the lad will go yonder and worship. So we see there there's no mention of singing. There's no mention of music. A lot of the time when we talk about worship, if we were to ask each and every one of us, what is worship? The tendency would be that for us, for us to say, oh, it's to do with singing or worship or uh, singing or music, but not necessarily so. So by God, by Abraham being willing to give up his son as, a, as an act of worship, we can see that worship has to do with God-centeredness. God-centeredness, the ability to give our best or to give what is most precious to us, to God. Hallelujah. Worship comes from the word worthship, worthship, something that is worth, worth, we feel is worthy. Amen. It is giving someone or something our first or highest love, giving our deepest affections and highest praise to something or someone. And we went through what it means to worship God. Number one, we said worship is acknowledging the holiness of God. Number two, we said worship is our response to God revealing himself to us. So we looked at an example when, when uh, Isaiah, when he saw the Lord, he said the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on the throne. And the throne, you know, the, 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 the temple would fill with smoke and his tr the trail of his robe filled the temple. And what did Isaiah say? He said, oh, I am a man of unclean lips. I, I dwell in the midst of an unclean people. It was an awe-inspiring moment. And that is worship. It's our response to the revelation of God. We see his bigness, his majesty, his magnificence, and it causes us to just worship. Hallelujah. So worship is our response to God revealing himself to us. And thirdly, we said worship is an attitude and a posture, not just physical, but also of the heart. So when we're in worship, we looked in Genesis 24, 26, and the man bowed down his head and worshiped the Lord. So we, we bow, Psalm 95, verse 6, let us kneel before, before the Lord our maker. These are postures we take in worship, bowing the head, kneeling before the Lord. Revelation 7, 11 said they fell before the throne on their faces. So full prostration is a, is a posture of worship. And we see in Psalm 134, verse 2, Psalm 134, verse 2, it says, lift up your hands in the sanctuary. So lifting up of hands is another posture of worship. But we have to remind ourselves that we're not just talking now 
about physical postures. We're talking about spiritual postures. So our heads, it's like we're bowed in our hearts. We're bowing our hearts. We're lifting our hearts in worship to the king. Amen. We're prostrating the heart in worship to the king. Amen. So it's not just physical worship now. We're talking about spiritual heart worship. Our heart has to be involved in it. Amen. So it's not just about, it's not really singing or what we call we're worshiping. It's more than that. We went on to look at how to worship God. If you remember, we looked at the tabernacle with the gates and the holy place and the most holy place. So there's a progressive approach of worship. The Bible says, we read that this morning in Psalm 100, that we enter into his gates with what? With thanksgiving. So there's a protocol. So we go in with thanksgiving and we go into his courts with with praise. So there's thanksgiving, there's praise. And then in the tabernacle, the, uh, the once a year, the priest used to go into the Holy of Holies. That's where they believed the presence of God was. But we will see in New, in New Testament worship, it's not just, uh, God doesn't just dwell in the tabernacle. He's everywhere. Amen? So there's that protocol, that progressive pr- protocol, and the elements of it are very important to, 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 to bear in mind. Amen. And then we wanted to say that after all that era, we rolled forward a thousand years, when Jesus was on earth and his path crossed that of a Samaritan woman in John 4, 1926, and that's where we'll start today. So we're reading from John 4, 1926. John 4, verse 19 to 26. Says the woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. And we need to just bear that in mind. This is what the Father desires. Not every sacrifice, not every worship, not every offering is acceptable. There are certain things that the Father seeks. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. I that speak unto him, unto thee am he. So what is Jesus saying here? Jesus is saying to the the woman, the Samarian woman, no need for you to wait for the Messiah to come. I'm here with you. Don't wait for revelation, future revelation. I'm telling you now how things are supposed to be from now on. So God, Jesus, was declaring, he was heralding a new dispensation of worship. He said, but the hour cometh and now is. So he, he, he kind of made, he, he drew a line between the old form of worship and the kind of acceptable new covenant, New Testament worship that he would expect henceforth. Amen. So that's the first thing about this passage. Jesus was heralding a new dispensation of worship. Jesus heralded a new dispensation of worship. That's number one. Now number two that we can learn from this passage. That location is no longer the priority for true worship. Location is no longer the priority for true worship. 
Jesus says, neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem shall we worship. And when you go through the history of the Bible, you see that the Samaritans, they emphasized Mount Gerizim as the place of worship. So the, that's the mount where I believe um, Jacob and Isaac, they both built uh, an altar. That's where um, Joseph, was it Joseph? Not Joseph. Jacob, where he wrestled with the angel, and he built an altar there. The Samaritans, or the Samarians, they believe that's the place of worship. The Jews emphasize Jerusalem as the place of worship, even up till now. So you will recall that when, the, when Solomon's temple was, was um, built in, in 1 Kings 8, Solomon prayed. We read that in 1 Kings 8, verse 29 to 30. This is when he was dedicating the temple in Jerusalem. 1 Kings 8, 29 to 30, he says, That thine eyes might be open toward this house night and day. He was praying to God, even toward the place of which thou hast said, My name will be there, Jerusalem. That they may, thou mayest hearken unto the prayer which thy servant shall make toward this place. And hearken thou to the supplication of thy servant and of thy people Israel. And when they shall pray toward this place, and hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and when thou hearest, forgive. So he was praying that, Lord, whenever someone prays towards Jerusalem, towards this temple, please hear us. Now, we were, fortunately, before all mayhem was, rele was released in Israel, we were in Israel in August. So we went to the Wailing Wall. I don't know if you've heard of that. It's believed to be the, the only standing the only things that remain standing from the old, from the second temple, the temple that was built after Solomon's temple. And the Jews still believe that if they go there to pray, that God will hear them. So they believe the presence of God is in that place. Up till now, pilgrims go there. We went there. We also prayed in front of this world, in, in, in front of this wall. So that wailing wall in Jerusalem is thought to be the only part of the second temple remaining and is up to, date, up to today the most important religious site for the Jews. But Jesus made it clear in this scripture that the place of worship is no longer the paramount thing. It's not whether, whether you worship in Southall or in Redbridge Wherever, that's not the essence. It's rather who is being worshipped. And it is the Father who is to be worshipped. And our worship is no longer tied to one place. Amen? So instead of thinking we can only pray in one place or worship in one place, 1 Timothy 2 verse 8, 1 Timothy 2 verse 8 says, I will therefore that men pray, what does it say? I, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. That's a sign of worship. Remember, we mentioned the posture of worship. So he desires that we pray everywhere, that we worship everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath or doubting. So Jesus was doing away with the veneration of location, and that was in fulfillment of prophecy in Malachi 1.11. Malachi 1 verse 11. And that says, From the rising of the sun, even to going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles in every place. In every place, incense. Incense is, a, is symbolic for worship. Incense shall be offered unto my name, and a pure offering for my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. Amen? So location is no longer, is not the paramount thing. It's who we are worshiping. Amen? And we should worship, we can worship God everywhere. Now for balance, because sometimes people can use this and say, well, that means I don't have to go to church. I can worship from home. I can worship in my kitchen or my bathroom or anywhere. Well, that is true. But let's be, remember, let's be reminded, Hebrews 10, 25. 
Hebrews 10, 25. There is not forsaken the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So the Bible adjures us to make sure that we continue to assemble, to assemble together. Amen? Fellowship is absolutely necessary. It's part of the things that keeps us strong as believers. Amen? Does everyone believe that? Yes. Hallelujah. So let's not say because Elder Femi has said that uh, location is not important. It's not the same as not coming to church. Amen? And for those of you who are in university, make sure you find a fellowship to attend. Okay. Third point, knowledge is essential for true worship. Knowledge is essential for true worship. True worship cannot be ignorant. It must be informed. Jesus said to the woman, you worship, you know not what. We know what we worship. Paul admonished the men of Athens likewise in Acts 17, verses 22 and 23. Acts 17, 22 to 23. Says then Paul stood in the midst of, the, of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and behold and beheld your devotions, where I beheld your devotions, I saw how you were worshipping. I beheld your devotions. I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Knowledge is essential for true worship. You need to know the God you're worshipping. You know, it's not just that you know of God. Somebody has told you of God. You can't worship a God that you do not know. So for, his, for you to offer worship that is, that is acceptable unto God, you got, you've got to know this God. Amen? So knowledge of what or knowledge of whom? Knowledge of the person you are worshiping is essential for true worship. Second Peter 3, verse 18. Second Peter 3.18, it says we should grow, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. So every day, we need to grow in the knowledge of God. We need to grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. John 17 verse 3, verse 3. John 17, verse 3. It says, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So we need to know the only true God. Hallelujah. That I, Paul, um, Paul said in Philippians 3, verse 10. Philippians 3, verse 10. It says that I may know him that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. The more we know him, the purer our worship, the more informed our worship is. We're not worshiping in a vacuum. It's not as if, well, okay, I see brother so-and-so worshiping in a particular way. Let me also worship that way. But you don't know him. You don't understand this God that you're worshiping. You cannot worship in a vacuum. Jeremiah 9. Jeremiah 9 verses 23 and 24. Jeremiah 9, 23 to 24. Thus, thus saith the Lord, let not the, the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let them that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Amen. This is a God, mighty, powerful, 
inexhaustible, limitless, uncomparable, but he still wants us to know him. Amen? He doesn't want to be this unreachable God. He wants us to know him. And that's exactly why Jesus Christ came, to pay the price, so that that separation between us and the Father will be removed. He tore away the veil. Amen? So he delights. He delights in us knowing him. He doesn't, he's not the kind of God that wants to push you away. He actually, he's inviting you. you. Amen? He's inviting us. He's saying that we should come to the throne of grace. He wants us to be in his presence. He wants us. Hallelujah. So we have to know him. We've got to desire to know him. And the more we know him, the purer our worship will be. The more effective our worship will be. Amen? Amen. How do we get knowledge of God? We get knowledge of God through revelation of Scripture. Through his word, we learn what he loves and what he hates. Knowing God goes beyond merely understanding the truth about him. It applies that truth personally. So as we go in the word, as we sit under the word, as we study, we get to know God more intimately. We know what he likes. We know what he doesn't like. Amen? But that knowledge is not just, it doesn't, it's just not mere understanding. God doesn't like fornication, so okay, I know that now. God doesn't like stealing, I know that now. God doesn't like lying, I know that now. But it's not just the understanding, it's the application. The application in our lives, amen? So the way we live, we actually apply that knowledge. Hallelujah. That is why James 1.22 James 1, verse 22. It says, Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only. Not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So as we know and we understand, we also apply. Hallelujah. Does that make sense? Yes. Hallelujah. So knowledge, in, verse, in, in, in John 14, verse 7, John 14, verse 7, Jesus said, if you had known me, you should have known the Father also. And from henceforth, you know him and have seen him. So what Jesus is saying is, if you, if you know me, you've known the Father. So beholding Jesus, understanding why Jesus came in the form of man to pay the penalty for sin, that is also knowing God. You know Jesus. If you know Jesus, you know God. You know the Father. You know the Son. You know the Father because they're one. And the same. And that real worship is based on relationship. So you must know who it is you are worshiping. Amen? That's, that's the next thing that we learned. Knowledge is essential for true worship. Number four, true worship is not possible outside of salvation. And salvation is of the Jews. True worship is not possible outside of salvation, and salvation is of the Jews. In Isaiah 60, verse 18, Isaiah 60, verse 18, it says, Violence shall no more be heard in thy land. Violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders. But thou shalt call thy walls salvation, and thy gates praise. Notice the link between salvation and praise. When you're saved and you understand your salvation, it moves you to worship. It moves you to praise. It moves you to being thankful. Amen? There's a connection there. Jesus states that salvation is of the Jews. What does that mean? Salvation is of the Jews. In, start, in stating that salvation of the, is of the Jews, Jesus is asserting that Jews had a pivotal role in God's redemptive plan. God chose the Jews to be the people through whom Messiah came to the earth. So Jesus was born in the flesh of the Jews. Romans 9 verse 4 to 5. Romans 9 verse 4 to 5. says, who are, the, who are Israelites? To whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises. Whose are the fathers? 
and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all. God blessed forever. Amen. Amen. So this, the, the genealogy, in terms of his, his uh, incarnation or his, his manhood, if we can put it that way, or his, his humanity, he was born of the lineage of the Jews. Amen. God also entrusted the Jews with his covenant. Romans 3, verses 1 to 2. Romans 3, 1 to 2 says, What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because unto them were committed the oracles of God. So God chose the Jews for him to, it's through the Jews that we got the commandments of God. Amen? So Jesus came through the Jews. The word was given to the Jews. The, the, the covenants, the oracles were given to the Jews. Psalm 147, verses 19 and 20. Psalm 147, 19 and 20. says, He showeth his word unto Jacob, or unto Israel. His statutes and his judgments unto Israel. He hath not dealt so with any nation. So even the word, the revelation of the word, came through the Jews. Now God could have chosen any nation because he's sovereign. He could have chosen Afghanistan. He could have chosen England. He could have chosen Spain. But he, in his infinite sovereignty, chose Israel. And up till now, sometimes there is that choice of Israel is despised. But I hazard a guess that if he had chosen any other nation, that same nation, that nation, whatever that nation is, would have been equally despised. Because that's just the way the world is. We always resist the things of the spirit. If you are not in the spirit, the flesh resists the things of the spirit. So God could have chosen any nation, but in his sovereignty he chose Israel. God's choice does not indicate preference, but rather function and purpose. He had a function, he had a purpose, and he chose Israel. God had a plan, and he determined to fulfill that plan through Israel. In Deuteronomy 7, verses 7 and to 9, Deuteronomy 7, 7 to 9, Moses reminds Israel that the Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand, and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen, from the hand of Pharaoh king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. So God is saying here, it's not because Israel is perfect. It's not because they're the biggest. It's not because they're the best. It's not because they are, they are even obedient, but he is exercising his sovereign will. He chose Israel. And salvation has come through that, that, that line. Amen? Amen? Hebrews 2 verse 3 says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? Peter declared in Acts 4 verses 10 to 12, Acts 4, 10 to 12, be it, been, be it known unto you all and all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand before you whole, because someone had been healed. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So even though some people and cultures despise the fact that salvation is of the Jews, 
To them, he, re he remains a rock of offense. But Jesus says of himself in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Remember, we talked about this progressive, this principle of progressive approach to God. So when we're talking about worship, we're talking about going into the presence of God. And Jesus is saying clearly here, no man can come unto the Father but by me. There's no other way into salvation. So true worship is not possible outside of salvation. And salvation is of the Jews. I'm not even aware that any other religion promises salvation. They tell you things to do, how to pray, what to do. But I, can't, I don't know that any other religion offers you salvation. Amen? So that was the, what was that, number four? Number four, that was number four. The wor true worship is not possible outside of salvation, and salvation is of the Jews. Okay, number five. True worship is impossible without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. True worship is impossible without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. True worship is spiritual, and we worship in spirit. So Jesus says, the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. So we now understand that in this dispensation heralded by Christ, the Spirit of God does not dwell in a tabernacle like we looked at last time, or a temple. It's not, low, it's not restricted to one place. Acts 17, verse 24. Acts 17, verse 24 says, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and you are not your own? Romans 8, verse 9. Romans 8 verse 9 says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You know, sometimes we read scriptures because we've read it so many times. We might, we might miss the import or the weightiness of what is being said here says, now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You can't say you are a believer, a Christian, without having the Spirit of God in you. Amen? So it's impossible for you to worship God, true, to offer true worship, without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5.18 to 20 Ephesians 5, 18 to 20, it says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So not just, not just by voice, in your heart to the Lord. Giving thanks always for all things, Unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So take note the results of being filled with the Spirit. It comes with some results. What are those results? You speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You make melody in your heart to the Lord. That's, that's a, a result. One of the results of being filled with the Spirit. There's an overflow. You know we use that word, overflow. You can't even contain yourself. You just go into worship as the Spirit of God wells up in you. Amen. Philippians 3, verse 3. Philippians 3, verse 3 says, For we are the circumcision which worship God in which way? In the Spirit. Philippians 3, verse 3. 
We worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. So when we worship in the spirit, what happens? We rejoice in Christ Jesus. It causes us to rejoice. Amen. There's a version of Romans 12 verse 1. The version I'm quoting from now is, Holman, is from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. It says, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. Spiritual worship. So it's not restricted to us singing. It's not just when we sing. It's our whole lives. Amen? Amen. It says, I urge you to present your bodies, that's our bodies, a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, and it's our spiritual worship. So our bodies, our minds, our spirits are all involved in worshiping God. So true worship is impossible without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Number six, worship must be in truth to be acceptable to God. Worship must be in truth to be acceptable to God. Jesus said, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So how do we worship in truth? Firstly, we must be in Christ. We must be in Christ. John 14, verse 6. John 14, verse 6, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So if Jesus is saying, I am the truth, that means we have to be in the truth to come unto the Father. So we must be in truth. So that's one way to interpret it. We must be in Christ. Truth is also grounded in God's word. John 17, verse 17. John 17, verse 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So the sanctifying work of the word of God empowers us to offer acceptable worship. Thirdly, true worship must be sincere. We could use the phrase, it should come from the heart. So the mere fact that we're lifting up hands and we're bowing down and we're prostrating and we're doing all those things, does not necessarily mean that we are sincere. Sin- worship must be sincere. Mark 7, verses 6 and 7. Mark 7, verse 6, said, He answered and said unto them, Well, well hath Esaias prophes- prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, These people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching the doctrines, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So when we're worshiping, it's not just external posturing. It must be sincere. It must be from the heart. It must be it must be deep. There must be depth to our worship. Amen. And it's comprehensive. It's not just when we're at church, our whole lifestyle is an act of worship to God. Amen? In that scripture, it says, in vain do they worship me. That means we could be worshiping in vain. If it's not true, if it's not sincere, it could be vain worship. May we not offer vain worship in Jesus' name. Hebrews 10.22. Hebrews 10.22. It says, let us draw near with a true heart, a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So that, that verse from G, that Jesus spoke about true worship, we learned six things from that. A, he was heralding a new dispensation of worship. Secondly, location is not a priority for true worship. Number three, Knowledge is essential for true worship. Number four, true worship is not possible outside of salvation 
and salvation is of the Jews. Number five, true worship is impossible without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Number six, worship must be in truth to be acceptable to God. So before we close, I just want to mention a few benefits of worship. So about four of them. Benefits of worship. Number one, in worship we are open to hear God's voice. In worship we are open to hear God's voice. Psalm 95 verses 6 and 7. Psalm 95, 6 and 7 says, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice. So worship opens our... In, in worship, we are open to hear God's voice. Number two, worship brings us near God's ear. Worship brings us near God's ear. John 9, 31. John 9, verse 31. says, Now we know that God heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. If any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Number three, true worship moves you to serve the Lord. True worship moves you to serve the Lord. Isaiah 6 from verse 1. I'll read through to verse 8. Isaiah 6 from verse 1 to 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. This is Isaiah saying this. I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth, and said, Lo, this hath touched my lips, my lips and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. So that was a culmination of him seeing God in his glory. It caused him to respond in awe. He recognized his own sin and the need of purging. And after that, when he heard the voice saying, Who will go for it? He offered himself up for service. Amen? So true worship moves you to serve the Lord. As you start to worship God intimately and in truth, eventually you just can't hold yourself back. You want to serve him in one way or the other. Matthew 4, verse 10. Just a reminder. Matthew 4, verse 10. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence. Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So your work for God must flow out of your worship. So worship and then service. Hallelujah. Number four, benefit of worship. Worship humbles us and moves us to repentance. Worship humbles us and moves us to repentance. We are all familiar with the story of Job. He went through some horrendous things. He spent a lot of the time complaining. And eventually, after complaints and discussion with his friends, God now responds to him in Job 38 from verse 1. So I read from verse 1. Job 38, 
verse 1 onwards. It says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Get up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding. If you are so wise, you tell me. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Tell me, where are the foundations of the earth? Can you show me where it is? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars stand together, and all the sons of God just shouted for joy, or who shut up the sea with the doors when it break forth, as if it had issued out of the womb, when I, had, when I made the cloud the garment thereof, and thick darkness as a swaddling band for it, and break up for it my decreed place, and set bars and doors, and said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further, and here shall thy proud waves be stayed, Hast thou commanded the morning since thy days, and caused the day spring to know his place, that it might take hold of the ends of the earth, that the wicked might be shaken out of it? And God continued in, 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 in chapter 41. Who, what, tell me, who do you think you are? That's basically God telling him. Were you there when I established the world? When I set the boundaries to the sea? When I made the, 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 the skies the covering for the earth? Where were you that you're complaining like this? Eventually, in Job 42 from verse 1, Job now starts to respond to God. Then Job answered, so Job, from Job 42 verse 1, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything. He's humbled now. He's now realizing this God is so awesome. It's an act of worship. And that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that handeth counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have I uttered that I understood not, things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you, my eye seeth thee. Wherefore I abhor myself, and repent in dust and ashes. When we behold God in his majesty, you know, we talked about it being the wow moment, how it just moves us to worship. We see our flaws. We see our emptiness. We see our flesh. It moves us to repent. That's one of the benefits of worship. A man or woman who does not worship God doesn't feel the need that they need God. But when we notice, the, when we recognize how much we need him, how much we need him, because without him we are nothing, it moves us to worship. Amen? Amen? So we worship in spirit and truth. It's no longer about going to Jerusalem or Mount Gerizim. It's not just about the outward, uh, the outward postures. It's about knowing God. It's about understanding him. And it's about being saved by him. Amen? So let us stand to our feet. Lord, as we acknowledge what you have done for us, how you continue to bless us. First of all, I want to give an opportunity for anyone who may be here or watching online to make that connection with God, the one and only true God. And the only way through to that one and true God is through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who came and he paid a price. He was crucified so that we might live and have eternal life. And he removed that wall of separation that was erected by our sin that stopped us from connecting to our Father. If you are such, please pray, please pray this prayer after me. And let's all pray this together. He said, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sin. I invite you to become my Lord and Savior from this day forward in Jesus' name. I believe that you died for me 
and in your death I have life. I believe that you were raised from the dead, and in your rising I am brought into new life. I thank you, Father God, that you have, I thank you, Lord, that you have paid this price for me, and I pray, Lord, that you start me on this journey where I get to know you more so that I am able to worship you in spirit and in truth. I thank you for this. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. If you've prayed that prayer for the first time, please contact us. We are very, we'll be very delighted to, to, to mentor you, to disciple you, so that you can grow in the ways of God. The, um, the details of the church will be put on the screen so that you can contact us. And may God bless you. Pray that this word will dwell in our hearts richly. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.